Everyone in Queensland will be choosing who they want to represent them in local council on March 16th. Along with councillors in their local electorate, all Brisbane residents will vote directly for who the next Lord Mayor of Brisbane will be. But do you really know who to choose and what each of the three candidates really stand for? To help you out, I arranged to interview all three candidates and ask them the exact same questions so that you can compare their answers and decide for yourself. The questions are not my own, but the questions on key issues subscribers of the Brisbane channel, along with other Brisbane community members, said were important to them. The three candidates each represent one of the major parties, Labor, the Liberal National Coalition and the Greens. For the Greens, Jonathan Sri Ranganathan will be running, for Labour, Tracy Price, and the current Lord Mayor Adrian Schriner will be running for the LNP. For these interviews, I did not share the questions with the candidates before I asked them, and I've included the answers given in full. As some may be quite long, I've divided the interviews into each question, so you can just skip to the issues you care most about. I braved a trip to the north side to interview Tracy at the Willow and Spoon Cafe in Wilston. So thanks for joining me and uh, agreeing to answer a few questions yeah. for the Brisbane channel. Thanks for asking. Yep. And so uh, let's kick into it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'd start by asking, what's your main motivation for running for Brisbane Lord Mayor in 2024? So I guess I've spent a long time working in community in and around Brisbane. Um, I love working at a grassroots level. Um, I've also been a lawyer in my own practice for a long time. Um, and I've, I really enjoy working in the areas of, you know, helping families rebuild lives and youth justice and child protection. Um, and for years, people have said that, you know, I'd be great in at a level, local level um, advocate. Um, I waited until my children were a bit, little bit older and, and then so the opportunity arose and I put in a nomination. I won pre-selection and here I am. So yeah, I have a real passion about making sure that people are looked after. Okay, great. So what do you see as the most important aspects of the role of being Brisbane's Lord Mayor? Yeah, we want to make sure that everybody across our city has a part of an or an opportunity to feel part of a community, part of what Brisbane is. Brisbane is an incredible city. I've seen it grow quite substantially. I've spent time living and working overseas and come back and, you know, Brisbane has grown over that time and I think that there's a real opportunity for a fresh vision. Um, the current council has been there 20 years, um, which is a very long time. And the general word around the suburb is that they're tired. They've lost their energy. They've got no new ideas. Um, all the focus has been on big projects in the inner city. My focus is about bringing a new energy, bringing life across our city and making sure that every community across Brisbane is looked after. What's your broad vision for Brisbane going forward? Yeah, I want, as I said, everybody to feel part of something. I want every part of our city to have a unique aspect about it so that people make it a destination. You know, we've got some amazing areas down in Wynnum on the foreshore. We've got, you know, Sandgate is awesome. We've got the Gap that offers so much down there. So every suburb across our city has something really unique and special to offer. And I want to make sure that the people in and around those communities treasure what, you know, what they actually moved into that suburb for. We need to look after that and, and preserve as well as ensuring that our city grows um, and is kept up with the population as it grows. But, you know, things like cost of living and public and active transport, congestion, they are issues that people have brought to me and said, these are real problems. And, you know, so we need to, whilst growing our city and having a great, beautiful vision where we can be the number one lifestyle city in the world, we've got to address those things moving. We've got to have a proactive rather than a reactive approach. So you talked about making sure that everybody's benefiting from what the council is doing, that you're looking after all the members of Brisbane society. So how do you balance the interests of everybody when sometimes different groups' interests may actually seem to be in conflict with each other? Yeah, look, that's part of any job, right, is ensuring there's always going to be conflict. Some people are always going to have different views. Um, as a lawyer who has been is also a mediator, I have dealt with high conflict resolution for a very long time. I understand that not everybody's needs can be met, 
but a lot of the time it's making sure that community is actually listened to. That is one of the biggest steps in reducing any confl conflict anywhere in any role, is making sure that you actually give community an opportunity to be heard and heard properly. You know, there's I'm hearing time and time again from people in and around Brisbane where they say, council just makes decisions. We put in, you know, information, we never hear back. Our view is not heard. They understand people, you know, that they can't always have what they want as their resolution, but it's about making sure that they're actually heard and worked with in order to understand both sides of every perspective. So let's focus in on some more specific uh, issues that, that people have raised you know, with me about you know, what they wanted to ask about. Um, the first is public transport. So what is your assessment of public transport at the moment and what are your plans for public transport into the future for Brisbane? So we have some big announcements um, coming in the next week about active and public transport. So that's quite exciting that what's coming, but as a big picture vision of what I want Brisbane to be in that space is obviously by increasing our public transport and our use of public transport, that's going to help with congestion on our roads. I think that I've lived in places like London and New York where you have amazing public transport systems. It is a better option than driving. Our current council's option is makes it better for people to drive than catch public transport. So until we actually fix our public transport system and we make it more accessible where you can turn up and there's a bus available within, you know, sort of a reasonable amount of time, not an hour where you've got to wait for an hour for another bus, people are not going to choose that as an option. If it's quicker for them to drive despite traffic to get into the city, they're going to drive. So until we actually fix our public transport by making it more reliable, safer for both our drivers and our users and more affordable and more regular and not having to go via the city for everything, nobody is going to choose public transport as a better option. So that kind of brings us to traffic congestion. So w what are your thoughts in terms of reducing that? That's one of the main concerns that people actually had when I asked them what they wanted to ask the candidates. So congestion is not going to be dealt with by building more roads. We need to give people options. By building more roads, more people are going to use them. That is not the vision that I have for Brisbane. I want to be able to get on and off public transport and use active travel and have the people of Brisbane doing that as opposed to be able to get in there and car. There will always be needs for cars. I'm not, I'm not saying that we can get rid of cars completely because there's always going to be a need for cars. But we need to be able to give people of Brisbane alternate options that are better. Okay. So you also mentioned active transport as part mm -hmm. of that, the public and active transport. So w do you have any clear plans for improving active transport in Brisbane? Yeah, look, we have issues all across the city where you can get on a bikeway and it just stops or you've got to cross main roads and it's not safe for kids to be able to just get on their bikes and go for a ride. We've got people that want to cycle to work, but they can't because of the safety issues, access, lack of connectability. All of that is going to be addressed in our announcement around active travel and public transport very soon. Okay, <laughs> maybe before this video comes out. <laughs> so obviously Brisbane is growing, as you mentioned, it's Australia's fastest growing city. So how do you plan to manage that population growth and also to mitigate against any potential negative effects of the increased population? Yeah, we've got, I mean, the housing crisis that we've got at the moment is a result of a long-term neglect of, of housing. It's delays in approvals going through council for property developers. I mean, I've worked in one of my areas in my legal practice is conveyancing. Um, I know firsthand how difficult it is for developers. And I'm talking about all levels of development. So your mum and dad investments right through to your big end developers, you know, your house and land packages. I know how difficult it is to get those approvals through council and the cost of those delays on the developers, whether it be the mum and dads or the high end investment, you know, big picture projects, it is taking months and months and sometimes years for those approvals to get through to the point where some of these developers will actually file in a court because they know that they can bring it to the forefront. And you know, the head costs that are involved in that 
is phenomenal. And, you know, and then those building costs get passed on to your mum and dad developers or your mum and dad builder. And so you'll be 18 months to two years down the track and their cost of their build goes up by 100 grand or 200 grand. It's just simply not acceptable. The council needs to take responsibility at the grassroots end to ensure that developments and approvals and processes are streamlined and dealt with efficiently. So in your view, what can Brisbane City Council actually do to improve the situation with the housing crisis and rental crisis? Well, that's part of getting approvals done. I mean, you know, we need to increase supply. The only way we're going to increase supply is getting developments happening, moving through the process. Albeit, you know, we announced some time ago that we would do an audit of all developments to see where they're at, what's causing the delays, see if we can work with developers and, you know, projects and stuff to get through council, see if we can assist that process. Because what I'm hearing is not that just that there's developments on hold because developers are causing the issue, but more along the lines that council's being restrictive. So council's not allowing those development approvals through quick enough. And it might not be that there's a problem with the development, but it's just the process within council is not happening fast enough. So Brisbane Olympics 2032, what's your position when it comes to the Olympics and also preparation for the Olympics? Look, the Olympics provides an, a really good opportunity for this city if it's done properly. I've always said that we need the Olympics to be a legacy across all our suburbs. I want our community sporting facilities, our women's change room. We've got some little kids right now that are so excited about the opportunity that that brings. You know, with an Olympics here in our own, in our own home city, it means that the kids all across our suburbs right now have goals and dreams that they want to fulfill that they may not be able to do if the Olympics is on the other side of the world. But it provides a real good opportunity for kids in our city right now, if we've got the right infrastructure and you know the right community organisations across our suburbs for the kids to be able to participate with the dream of participating in the Olympics in 2032. It's exciting, but we need to make sure that we use this opportunity to ensure that our transport infrastructure is good. You know, our community sporting facilities are the best in the world. Um, I'm not going to get into a debate about big stadium pitches because I've always said that I want the legacy to be in and around our suburbs. You know, track and field opportunities, you know, local sporting facilities, women's change rooms so the girls can actually join a club that has the facility to be able to train. You know, we don't have that across our suburbs and that, that neglect is as a result of the tired LNP council of 20 years. Do you have any plans for further flood mitigation and also uh, making Brisbane more flood resilient? Absolutely. I know firsthand what it's like to be flooded. I, my sewing shop was completely flooded in February last year and or February 2022 now, <laughs> not last year. Um, and we're still recovering from that. It's, you know, whilst I was able to fit my shop out, get restocked, have all of that, the lasting effects are, are there. You know, when we've had seen the rain in the last couple of weeks, you know, you think, is this going to happen again? And I feel for the people who took 18 months, two years, still got home effects, you know, with their drainage. The council's done nothing to mitigate that drainage. We're not going to see less of them. We're going to see more of them, more, you know, extreme disasters. And we did, re we released a policy about making sure our city is climate resilient. And that includes increasing drainage, you know, desilting our creeks, ensuring that our creeks are adequate enough to, to take on the flow of the water um, through that comes through Brisbane. I want, you know, to work with people that would like to raise their houses. I've had people reach out to me that said that the council is refusing to allow them to increase their house above the last level of flood. That is ridiculous. If people want to remain in their home and they've put an application in to increase their housing above the previous flood levels, why is council not allowing them to do that? That is just ludicrous. You know, I mean, that that is a no-brainer to me. Let's work with these people. Some people want to leave their homes, but there's people that don't want to leave their homes. Let's work with them to see what we can do to mitigate future flooding in and around the homes that they want to remain in. So you did mention earlier about building that sense of community. So how do you actually intend to 
build the sense of community within Brisbane? Yeah, I mean, you know, people um, really need to feel part of something. When people feel part of something, it creates opportunities across our community, whether that be part of your local supporting, your local sporting community, your local school, your local PNC, you know, your local work community, your local um, fun run community that, you know, Park Run have been an amazing um institution that's brought community together in and around parks and it's those sorts of things that create opportunity council has has been reported of being quite obstructive about allowing community to organically grow and i think that community need to help facilitate oh sorry council need to help facilitate the growth of community rather than be restrictive and so i think that you know, council plays a big part of that. Um, so about approvals and, you know, making sort of community grow organically in areas, um, as well as promoting the ability for people to be part of a club. So by growing the ability to put in female change rooms, for example, um, naturally and organically grows community in and around our suburbs. What kind of culture do you think uh, within Brisbane City Council is most conducive to actually getting things done? And how can you, how do you intend to actually promote that kind of culture within the council? Yeah, I, leadership is a big, um, is a big issue in council at the moment. You know, problems come from the top. You can't have an effective council at ground level if the issues stem from the top. And I want to be a very positive leader that gets things done and promotes the efficiency and the ability to work with people at all levels. I want to hear from all levels within council about how they think things could be done better. You know, I hear all the time about issues at a ground level in council. And this is not a reflection on the workers within council because though that, that culture comes from the top. But I wanna make sure that I will work with all levels within council to make sure that we do things for the benefit of our, our residents all across our city. You know, I hear all the time that people ring council and they don't get anywhere and, and their complaints and they're just palmed off. That comes because of the lack of ability for people to be able to make decisions, get work done, see through, you know, get feedback through to the higher levels in council. And that, that stuff's got to stop because if you're a strong, efficient leader, you will be and work with, approach, you'll be approachable, you'll be able to sit down and have those tough conversations and that's the leadership that I want. Okay. Some of the subscribers of the Brisbane Channel also wanted to ask if you could describe something that you actually respect about each of the other candidates. Something I respect? Um, Jonathan, I think, is very good at kind of throwing out an extreme view that, that draws attention to a particular issue. Whilst I don't necessarily agree with all of his policies, um, I certainly think that he brings issues to the forefront quite quickly. So he has the ability to um, bring an issue quite quickly to community's attention. Um, you know, I don't have to agree with his policy um, and I don't agree with a lot of his policy, but there are some things that he brings to the forefront quite quickly that, that when you look at contrasting, the LNP just don't even want to pay attention to. They don't even want to come to the table to discuss. Um, and I think that that's probably something that he does. Um, whether I agree with that approach is another issue, but that is something that he has the ability to do. Um, and Adrian, um, Adrian has a long-term sort of, I guess, experience within council. He has been in council at a council level. He's then gone on to become the Lord Mayor. Um, I have a very different view about the benefit of that. I believe that people at all levels of government should have life experience. Um, I think that we, I bring a very different perspective to Brisbane. Um, I've lived in massive cities around the world. I've got experience in, you know, talking at different levels of, of you know, the community. Um, I've worked hands in. I've not done community because I'm a politician. I've done community because I love it and I've, 
felt very strongly about volunteering and giving back to community. And now I'm going into politics, so I have a very different view on what it means to be part of community. Um, but certainly there are, there are benefits to him being a long-term politician and, and working at different levels of government in a, at a local level. So I guess, you know, you know, it's balancing, it's like perspective, right? We've all got different perspectives on things. And I think that I can recognise that advantage, but I also recognise the alternative that I bring, which is a wealth of experience working in different areas um, over time and, and working within the community because it's what I love, not because I've had to as a politician. Hmm. So obviously with the cost of living, a lot of people are really feeling financial pressure. So with all of these plans that you have for Brisbane, do you see rates increasing in the near future? So my, my view is straight up, first thing I'll do in the week is review where all the money's being spent. You know, over the last 20 years, council has reached a point where they only put in the budget high level figures. We don't see line by line items that they where they're spending their money. And I think that is completely unacceptable. When they first went in and certainly under, you know, the Jim Sawley days, we saw very detailed information about where money was being spent. We are now at a point where we only get big figure dollars. You know, we don't get line by line. I want to know where every single dollar of ratepayers money is being spent. I know that it's in the sum of around $4 million that is spent on advertising material that allows the Shrina Council, which is what he's calling himself now, which it's not the Shrina Council, it is the Brisbane City Council. Why they're rebranding at the Shrina Council is only a marketing ploy to pretend that there's no election coming and that everything is under Adrian and it's all glorified. Well, I'm sorry, $4 million of ratepayers' money is being spent on the self-advertising of Adrian Shrina and the current LNP councillors. That is not acceptable. We have Labor and Greens councillors that are currently working for the Brisbane City Council as their local councillor. He, he doesn't include them in the Shrinner Council brand. Um, you know, his whole website, adrianshrinner.com.au, is branded blue and gold. It's got the Brisbane City logo, you know, logo in the top corner. That is not what Brisbane City Council is. It's not the Shrinner Council. It's Brisbane City Council. And so, you know, where's that $4 million being spent? It's unacceptable that it's being spent putting Adrian Schrinner and his local members or his local councillors, LNP councillors, all over Brisbane. You know, I want to cut the advertising that the council spends. We're, we've moved to an age where we don't need all of our tip vouchers to be sent out with a brochure, a glossy brochure, with Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner's photo on it. You know, we can move to an age where we've got electronic means to have vouchers being spent. I've got a PO box that every time there is a glossy living in Brisbane brochure that's sent out, the bin is full of the brochures being dumped. Why are we still spending money on that? Rate payers money. So if, as far as I'm concerned, it's about making sure that every dollar that is going through council is spent well, and then we will be able to look at saving money for the ratepayers to keep the cost of rates down. I'm a ratepayer. I don't want to pay rates as much as my next door neighbour. I don't want my, you know, rates to keep going up at the rate they have. They've gone up 17% under Adrian Schrinner. That is a lot of money. And you know, when he's got, he's cutting, so in June, July, when he put the rates up, he announces a surplus in August and then a cut of 400 million in October. When you've got Okay, so you've put the rates up and then within October you're announcing a cut. Where, those rates went up quite considerably. Why are you then having to cut 400 million? That can only happen as a result of bad budgeting, but we can't see the line by line where he's spending his money. We're only seeing the large, large overarching figures. And I, the first thing I wanna do is make sure that every single dollar that is going through council is accounted for and spent effectively. All right, so now for the really contentious issues, the, the, the most divisive issues of all. It may come down to these issues and where you stand on these as to who people are going to vote for. So question number one, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? <laughs> definitely. Okay, so this is quite controversial in my house because I'm definitely a pineapple person on pizza. My husband, pineapple and onions, no. 
flat out no. So we always order multiple pizzas in our home. So yeah, no, I'm for pineapple on pizza. I'm a Queenslander, you gotta have pineapple on pizza. <laughs> Ibis or curlew? Oh, okay. Ibises are quite iconic, right? Even though they cop a lot of slack, they're quite iconic. I, oh, I could imagine Jono's for the Ibis. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I'll just go curly just to be controversial. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, Vegemite, should it be in the fridge or in the pantry? Oh, we have this debate at home as well. So we've actually got two jars of Vegemite, one in the fridge and one in the pantry. Okay, so which so, is your jar? So, well, it depends how I'm having it. If I'm having it with toast and melted butter, it's from the cupboard, right? If I'm having it on toast with avocado, then it's from the fridge. Where is that? <laughs> Just because it, it spreads nicer. Okay. <laughs> with the avocado. You've got to put the Vegemite on first though. Vegemite on toast with butter and avocado on top. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, thank you for answering, the, answering those and other difficult questions. Um, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate no that. No problem. And uh, best of luck with the, the campaign. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right.